and we can switch for the last speaker of the session, who is Fabrizio Gentili. And uh, we are Fabrizio will be talking about radio selected near infrared dark galaxies and the Alma view behind the dust. Hey, hi. Um, I try to share my screen. Okay, can you see? Perfect, very, very good. Okay, so hi everybody. Uh, my name is Fabrizio Gentile. I'm currently a second year PhD student at the University of Bologna. And today I'm going to talk about my PhD project that is about the radio selected near dark galaxies, and in particular on what we can learn about these sources with, the, with ALMA. Um, I'll start with a brief introduction. Uh, this is what I call the Seren landscape that we had on galaxy evolution until uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we were actually observing a population of massive galaxies that were in the local universe. They had a huge mass uh, above 10 to the 11th solar masses, uh, and they were crescent. And all the studies uh, of spectroscopy and stellar archaeology about these galaxies were pointing toward the formation redshift uh, around uh, 1 and 2. And this was quite in agreement with what we knew about the so-called circumferential density. There is the average quantity of stellar mass that is created uh, uh, around the universe for each year and for each uh, cubic megaparsec. And you can see that actually at this formation redshift, uh, the universe was ex experiencing uh, his peak in the self-formation density, the so-called uh, uh, cosmic noon. But everything changed around uh, 2014 when several collaborations started to unveil a uh, population of massive and crescent galaxies that were already in place uh, at redshift around 3.5. Uh, these galaxies uh, should have a formation redshift uh, above 4.5, and this is a problem for at least uh, two order of reasons. Uh, the first one is that if we um, see again the, um, the matter plot, there is the self-formation density as a function of the redshift, we can see that around redshift 4.5, the universe was not creating so much stars, and so it is hard to search for progenitors in this region of the cosmic history. And the second problem is that if we compute the number density for these uh, massive galaxies at a redshift, uh, we can see that this number density is at least two orders of magnitude higher than the known high Z galaxies uh, that are found at redshift 4.5. So we are actually missing the progenitors of these galaxies. Um, now, so we have to solve this problem. And before trying to change our paradigm of um, self formation, uh, maybe we should be sure that we are not experiencing a selection bias. Uh, a likely selection bias could arise because of the, of the wavelengths on which we are performing our studies. In particular, we can see that most of the uh, high redshift galaxies that were known in 2014 and most of the studies that were uh, studying the um, uh, self formation density at redshift uh, higher than three were actually based uh, on uh, uh, optically selected galaxies. At this redshift, uh, it means that we are uh, we are studying just rest frame uh, ultraviolet bright galaxies. Uh, we are lacking most of the constraints uh, at higher redshift uh, in the infrared uh, rest frame. So we could have a, a selection bias, a significant selection bias, if there is a population of galaxies that is missed in optical surveys. And actually, one of these populations could be the so-called dusty self-forming galaxies, where we have a normal self-forming galaxy. You can see here a normal CD of a self-forming galaxy. But if we have an, a significant amount of dust, uh, the fluxes in the optical and the infrared regime uh, can become invisible, in this case, below the, the detection limit of our survey. And all this energy can be uh, remitted at longer wavelengths uh, in the infrared and in the, in the submillimeter. Um, and most of the studies that are uh, studying the star formation density at longer wavelengths, so selecting a galaxy in the infrared or in the millimeter, are finding a, a different behavior of the star formation density with a flatter behavior at higher redshift. And so uh, if these studies are correct, uh, we could solve the problem of the missing progenitors of the um, massive galaxies around redshift 3. Uh, the problem now is that most of these studies are based on just a handful of galaxies. You can see here the numbers of one of the main studies uh, um, in this plot. And so uh, we have a problem. We have to uh, select a statistical sample 
of uh, dust is forming galaxies to be sure that all these results are not just um, biased by low statistics. Um, and now the problem is that, of course, we cannot select these galaxies in the optical because our galaxies are invisible in this regime. In the far infrared, uh, we are currently lacking uh, uh, an instrument that is sensitive enough uh, and with a small beam size for unveiling this population of galaxies. We could uh, solve these issues with uh, with ALMA, uh, but we know that currently ALMA is not designed for large sky surveys, so we don't have, uh, we are not mapping uh, uh, sufficient uh, cosmological volumes for be sure that we are not prone to cosmic variants. And so with my group, we started to investigate uh, longer wavelengths, so searching for uh, uh, dust surforming galaxies in the radio, because we know that radio is a good tracer of star formation, and it has the advantage of not being uh, affected by the presence of dust. In particular, we focused on the cosmos field, and we were able to select uh, 323, uh, we call them radio-selected nidal galaxies, there are galaxies that are bright at 3 gigahertz, so in the radio, and they are lacking uh, an optical and near infrared counterpart uh, in the Cosmos 2020 catalog. That is the main catalog of the Cosmos field. And the main task of my first year of PhD was to establish what is the nature of these sources. Uh, of course, I had to extract the photometry, so to build a photometric catalog, and so I took advantage of all the different telescopes that observed the cosmos field across the many years of this field. And I had to extract the, the photometry. In this case, uh, I had to face a real problem that is the source blending. In particular, my paper is the third in a series. Uh, my supervisor, Margherita Talia and Marian Beiri, that also had a talk on this subject yesterday uh, in this conference. Uh, they just focused on the isolated or almost isolated sources, so all the sources without a bright contaminant in the environment. Uh, I'm focusing on the full sample of sources, and so I'm facing this kind of uh, galaxies. Here I have my invisible galaxy in the infrared, and I have a bright contaminant super nearby. So if I am not able to subtract this contaminant, I cannot obtain a flux for this source. And at longer wavelengths, for example, in Iraq, uh, I have to deblend uh, an image in which I cannot recognize two components. So it's impossible to uh, blindly deblend these components. And this is the reason why I developed uh, a code that is called uh, FIBO, Photometric Structure for Blended Objects. And without giving too much details, uh, is essentially based on a PSF matching and on a double uh, uh, prior coming from the 3 gigahertz map in which my source is visible and on the near infrared map on which the contaminant is visible. And thanks to this pipeline, I'm able to subtract the contaminant in the blended images and obtain an image on which I can perform just a normal aperture photometry for extracting the, um, the fluxes. Uh, thanks to this algorithm, I was able to extract the photometry in the optical, near infrared, and mid infrared. Then I just cross checked, uh, cross matched with uh, a lot of other catalogs in the far infrared, in the submillimeter, in the radio. And so I was able to reconstruct the spectral energy distribution of my sources from the optical to the radio. Then I used this um, photometric catalog for uh, an SCD fitting performed with two different uh, algorithms that are um, Magnus and Seagal. And so I was able to extract the, to estimate the photometric redshifts and the physical properties. And these are my main results. Uh, as you can see, we are facing a population around the cosmic noon, so with a redshift uh, be, between 2.5 and 3, with a significant tail of sources uh, at redshift higher than 4.5. So there are the actually uh, likely progenitors of the massive galaxies around redshift 3. We can see that these galaxies are quite massive and they are currently uh, forming a lot of stars. Uh, and they are, of course, uh, uh, highly extinct in the, by the last. Uh, just to add some details, if we compare the star formation with the, the star formation that is expected for a main sequence galaxy in the different uh, redshift beams, you can see that most of the galaxies are lying above the main sequence. In particular, 40% of the sample are just star forming galaxies, while 50, 55% of the galaxies in the sample are classified as star burst galaxies. Now, the problem is that, of course, we have poor constraint on the stellar masses because 
We don't have any just upper limits in the optical and the infrared, and all the other properties are estimated just through the photometric redshift and through SED fitting. So we need to collect more data about these galaxies for being sure that our results are robust. And here we have a problem because, and this is why now I'm invoking Galma. This is the reason why I'm here today, uh, because of course uh, for us is super complicated to get data on invisible galaxies, because as you can see, I don't have any flux uh, for bands bluer than K. And so I have to invoke uh, on the one side, JWST, because Cosmos will be covered by the Cosmos Web collaboration. And so I will have some data in the near infrared and mid infrared, much deeper than Ultra Vista and IRAC. Uh, but of course I can rely on Alma. Uh, this is the reason why with my group, we started a series of programs in Alma and Noima, asking for spectral scans for a pilot sample that currently is about uh, 11 galaxies. Uh, in particular, the main goal is to confirm the, the photometric redshift of, of our sources and thank to this also to strengthen the um, set fitting results. And then, of course, uh, thank just to the millimeter observation to estimate the gas mass and to measure the dust temperature and some other um, results. Uh, I have just the, I have uh, the, the ALMA just delivered the data a few months ago. So this is everything from now on is just a work in progress. So as a super preliminary, these results. But our idea was to ask for a spectral scan in band three. Uh, and in this way, you can see that for redshift higher than three, we always have two transition of uh, CO and C1. Uh, they are uh, confirming unambiguously the uh, redshift of our sources. Uh, I'm showing here, for example, one of our sources. This is a spectrum that we extracted from the ALMA data. You can see that here we have a CO transition and a C1 transition. And these are the moments, uh, uh, the zero moments of the two lines, just imagined in the small range of uh, wavelengths covered by our sources. And you can see that thanks to this, uh, to this spectrum, we can uh, identify the redshift of our sources. And as you can see, this is a comparison between the photometric redshift that we estimated with Max and Gall, and these are the, the spectroscopic redshift that we inferred with several techniques, in particular the green uh, bars are the ALMA data. And you can see that there is quite a good agreement between our photometric redshift and the spectroscopic redshift. In particular, we can quantify the scatter among the relation at 0 0.07. That is quite good for our considering we don't have any, any prior about the optical and infrared for our galaxies. And uh, so these are my conclusion. Of course, as I told you, it's just an ongoing um, project. In particular, we have ongoing uh, ALMA, NUIM, and JWC programs that will give us uh, a plethora of new data about the sources. So stay tuned about our results. And thank you for your attention. And I'm ready for questions. Thank you very much, Fabrizio. You were in time. So we have plenty of time for questions. Uh, first comment is, uh, it seems that you have a very beautiful logo of Voibol. Can you show us uh, the logo again and uh, maybe advertise your, your code a little bit more? I know that some of the people have been using it. Ivana was- a... Yeah, Ivana, uh, that also had a talk uh, today. She's using this for the blending uh, her galaxy merger in, uh, in Iraq, because of course, uh, Everyone that is dealing with the IRAC images have the same problem of trying to subtract the contaminants and the blend. Uh, FIBO will be, will be described in my paper that we currently submitted to APJ. So I hope that in a few months it will be available on uh, the archive, the paper. And uh, at the same time, we would like to uh, release, publicly release the FIBO code on GitHub so that all the community can uh, use it for their science. Good. So we hope it is useful for, <laughs> for everyone. Thank you very much. We have a question from uh, Abhijit. Yeah, I wanted to ask also about the FIBO code. Uh, will this be a useful uh, tool for checking whether a galaxy merging system or a uh, galaxy has a dual AGN or binary AGN system? So to sort of try to see whether there are two different emission uh, sort of nuclei present in one system. Yeah, um, at the moment, okay, I can show you one of my backup slides, <laughs> because actually uh, we made a validation of our codes on simulation, 
And you can see that the accuracy of the algorithm is decreasing with the increasing blending between the two components. Uh, so this is the, the distance between the centroids of the two galaxies parameterized as the sum of the full width and maximum. And you can see that when the two galaxies are almost the same, also in the uh, high resolution image, for example, the radio or the ultravista, uh, the accuracy of the algorithm is decreasing uh, it's still reasonable, okay? It is just uh, one tenth of a magnitude. But so I think that in case of galaxy mergers, we have to, to see if we have a um, uh, high resolution image. Well, the resolution of the high resolution image is high enough for um, allowing the code. But uh, as I saw from uh, Ivana's results uh, that she was dealing with a merger, I think that the, the code uh, is working well. <laughs> then I hope to see the, the ACD fitting result for seeing if, uh, we are just overestimating the fluxes, but I'm quite confident. Okay, that's really fantastic. Thank you so much. So you can enter your questions in the chat or raise your hand. So in the meantime, maybe I can ask, uh, you show only one spectrum of uh, ALMA from ALMA? So yeah. you have several galaxies. How long do it take to, to get the redshift confirmation to get an uh, ALMA spectrum like this, per source? Uh, actually, the redshift confirmation was quite easy because some lines are quite visible. Uh, but of course, uh, I showed the best case scenario when both the lines are, have a high signal to noise ratio and so on. In other cases, we had to clean all the images and now we are trying to extract the spectrum uh, in the UV space. Also, because you can see that uh, there is a small displacement between the two lines, for example, in this case. So if you're just extracting in a fixed aperture, we are taking uh, a much noisier uh, spectrum. So I hope I will, I hope I, that I need a, a month <laughs> for cleaning all the data and for extracting a secure redshift. And then of course, there is a problem of reliability of the two lines. Because in this case, the signal to noise ratio is above five. So we are pretty sure that this galaxy, that these lines are true. But in other cases, we have lines uh, that are at two sigmas or three sigmas. So in this case, it's much harder to assess the reliability of the, um, of the, the lines. We saw from the literature, there are a lot of different strategies for estimating the reliability and there are a lot of different codes. So with my co-authors, we are trying to find the best way to be sure that our lines are actually lines and the redshift is the same as the, what we are measuring. So I hope that this paper will be out uh, in the second half of the year. My, my question was actually the observing time with Emma, because this has to be- Ah, sorry, I know, <laughs> I think the, the technical part. Um, I think the integration time for, for these sources, uh, uh, since we had to split uh, the band three in three in five different uh, settings for covering all the yes. uh, bands with the um, with the side bands. I think that we requested something like uh, uh, thirty or forty hours for the whole sample of nine galaxies. But I can check on the proposal and write it on the on the Slack. Well, just just a matter of curiosity to for people to realize how much uh, how much time it takes to make a spectrum like this, and also because yeah, you 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 need to do this spectral scan. Uh, Special method to cover the wide fre frequency range, right? Yeah. No, actually, because we decided to be completely blind and so to cover all the band three. But actually, now that we know that our um, photometric redshifts are quite accurate, maybe for the next uh, proposal we will just cast uh, smaller windows just to cover the expected uh, position of the lines. Well, you should not claim too loud that the the, spectro the photometric redshifts are too good because otherwise they will not give you all my time anymore. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, last year, it was one of the comments of the referee was that our uh, redshift were not sure, and so we were not sure of how many times we have to request. So I would say they are good, but not enough. So we still need the spectroscopic confirmation. No, it's very, very interesting, and uh, it's nice to, to have Alma at least that we can look at these very mysterious galaxies. <laughs> it should be very frustrating to not to be able to get any more data. At the other wavelengths. Uh, Sebastian, there is a question from Ivana. Okay. So Ivana, please. Hi, very nice talk, very interesting. Um, I was wondering, so I'm very curious to your code. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the paper that's coming out. 
Uh, I was wondering if you knew uh, about the code Mofongo from Ivo Laba. Uh, I don't think he has it like publicly on, on GitHub, but I was wondering if you knew about it and how your code compares because he uh, uses high re the high resolution data uh, to kind of like model what your source would look like in low resolution, but very deep data. So you can also extract the photometry from sources very close to each other. Oh, no, I didn't know about this code. So if you can give me a reference in the chat, I will, of course, uh, check it out and see what is the difference between the different codes. Uh, during the first year of my PhD, I tried a lot of different codes for trying to extract the photometry. Uh, but since our galaxies are uh, invisible in the optical, uh, with the problem of like all the profile fitting code were not working in this case. So I have to check what is the technique of this code. But if you can give me the reference, I will of course, check it out and come yeah. back on this. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know how well he has described it in previous papers. I feel like it's kind of mouth to mouth at this point, his code, but I will look some, uh, I will search some papers for you. Thanks. Thank okay, you. thank you. So do we have uh, one more question? No, no. Uh, there's a hand up from Joshua, so. I got a very quick question, but it's more on the methodology side. So if you so if you extract the spectra from the visibility plane, what is like the way to get an error bar just to calculate standard deviation over your spectra or not? Uh, I'm still working on this. Uh, I saw that there is a code that is called uh, UV Multifit that is developed by the uh, UK node of the... Nordic. Uh, Nordic node. Arca, I'm, I think, I'm not there. The Nordic node, okay, thank you. <laughs> of course, you're more expert than me in this. And so I'm using this code for fitting the visibilities. And then I saw that there is a, an error coming from the, the code that I think is um, an error coming from the, the fitting. Uh, then I think I will use the error mess of the map and see what is the difference between the two, the two errors. And okay. if I have to sum them, sum in quadrature, or I have to, to work on this. Okay, thanks. Okay, very good. So this concludes our morning session. So thank you again, Fabrizio. And let's thank all the speakers of the morning session.